we are live. So, welcome to shopping. Nineteen ninety four shopping, sometimes spelt with the dollar sign instead of an S. Review and thoughts film. Now. I realize this video is long, I'm going to do what I can to make it worth your time. Also, if you're only interested in the view, that part of the video is not the whole length of the video. This is length, check the time codes in the description box. I'm currently dealing with some back pain, but I still have a lot to say about the movies that I watch. So I'm going to speak faster until my back feels better. I start this video with a review, most likely with zero spoilers. If I spoil anything, I will verbally warn before I do so and hold up an index finger until I'm done with the spoilers. You can mute and skip ahead until you see me lower my index finger as well. but as soon as I end the video review itself please note the rest of the video will have lots of spoilers including discussing the ending and yes I do sometimes review something that nobody but myself still cares about I'm reviewing it because I like reviewing and this is something that I wanted to review I think I need to adjust the lighting a tiny bit yeah that looks better I don't have any personal issues with almost any filmmakers, and I almost never let any issues that I might have interfere with my review and analysis. So content warning and or trigger warning. The This movie features the following, and I am going to be discussing at least some of the following potentially triggering content. Violence, drugs, let's see. death, and abuse of minorities. Also, please note that I have a tendency to sometimes, when I'm discussing a sensitive subject, use descriptive terms that I consider neutral that other people consider negative so if I say something that sounds judgmental it may very well just be that I take for granted that people know I'm being descriptive and not judgmental I'm not trying to be disrespectful and also I'll do my best to pronounce everyone's names correctly if I get some wrong it's not that I'm intentionally making fun of them the movie is rated R and so is this video so I will swear at least some in this video for those bothered by that. This video is not going to contain any clips of any kind. The most visual gets is when I sometimes act something out. So feel free to watch something visual, such as clips from the movie in another tab. I won't mind. I'll know, but I mean, I won't know. Of course, I'm not spying on you right now. I don't have a couple of small-time criminal types standing outside your home. Of course, that's because they got distracted when they saw a car they wanted to steal. Now, I got this movie on sale, so anything negative I say in this video is not out of bitterness. I don't feel like the movie wasted my time. Nobody forced me to watch it or to make this video. It's not that I'm upset at how it compares to other mo movies like it. What I was expecting, the trailers and other marketing, later movies made by the same filmmakers. I don't have some personal vendetta against anyone who worked on making it. To the best of my ability, the negative things I say in this are fair criticisms based on budget, when it came out, what it was trying to achieve, etc. Now, when I when I'm going to do a video on a movie that is not completely new, I try to put myself in the mindset of someone from that period experiencing it for the first time back when it originally came out. And since we're still dealing with Corona, I want to say during this video, it's possible that I will touch my face. I want to assure you I've washed my hands since the last time I was outside, and I will wash my hands again before going out. So, this is my first viewing of this film, unless it, it's, there's a chance that I watched it, you know, when it was relatively new and I just forgot about it. But, if not, this is my first viewing, and certainly I watched it, say, right before now vlogging about it. And I know some some people say that, you know, watching a movie once isn't enough to form a final opinion. 
I, I disagree. And there are movies that I've only watched once that I feel, you know, I... I, I feel I appreciate them without having to watch them again. And just so you don't think that I only like movies from other decades, you know, an, another 1990s movie that I absolutely love is Con Air from 1997. It's only three years after this one. And yeah, I, actually, I grew up in the 90s. I remember them quite well. So I, I don't have any... I don't think less of movies that were from back then. Obviously, it's not going to move as fast, and, you know, a number of things aren't going to look as good as they do now. Anyway, plot. We're in England. I wish I could be more specific, but it's not quite clear exactly where or exactly when. Billy and Joe, a couple of young small-time criminals, go around the city stealing cars, crashing into, you know, the the yeah the the shopping that the the title refers to is them crashing cars into store windows and then you know going into the store stealing and leaving before getting caught without getting caught. Now, let's see, the, um, yeah, the, you know, Billy just got out of prison and, you know, his turf is being challenged and, you know, obviously that leads to a conflict. It's not that they don't give a damn about their bad reputation, they seem to relish it. And yeah, it's, I'm gonna. This is this is the IMDb plot. Uh, I forget what it's called. It can't be a synopsis. A s summary maybe. You've run out of options. No school. No job. Steal a car. Smash a shop with a heavy car. Reap the proceeds. This movie's about the underground England. The causes, the benefits, and the the results of the life of Crash and Gary. I don't know. I, I just felt like I had to go with a British accent for that. And, yeah, before I get further into the review, in the interest of full disclosure, I've never in real life behaved the way that the characters do in this, but I am a big fan of the Grand Theft Auto games. I've played the first one, the third one, Vice City, San Andreas, four, both of the expansion packs to four. I haven't played the others. I definitely do think that this kind of behavior in real life is wrong, though it seems to me like it's more frequently kids blowing off steam than some kind of organized effort to destroy society. I agree that this film at times glorifies this behavior, but I doubt very many people got the idea to do these things from watching this movie. More likely, it just reflected the behavior of a certain group. Now... Yeah, so the according to IMDb, this is an action crime drama thriller. And the the action is is decent. Like you know, it's it's low budget. <sighs> yeah, yeah. For for a low budget early to mid nineties action thriller, the action is quite good. Uh, the it delivers on the the. I suppose you could say there's not a lot of variety to the action. A lot of it involves cars but beyond that yeah it like like if you just you know if you just want to spend a little time watching yeah early to mid 90s low budget action thriller and you don't mind that a lot of it involves cars and it's relative there's not a lot of variety then yeah i i recommend yeah, and yeah, the the scenes of the the crime and drama elements also work well, and you know basically part of the concept here is you know the 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 movie seeks to make us empathize with troubled youth who do small time crimes, and. 
you know, Paul W. Anderson making at least one movie in Britain before mostly making ones in America, or at least partially in America. Now, the IMDb more like this list compares this to Soldier, which I rate a 6 out of 10. The Site, which is now the only thing that Paul W. Anderson has written and or directed, but I have not yet watched. Event Horizon, which I rate a 7 out of 10, and Southland Tales, which I rate a 6 out of 10. I'm not sure what the connection is between Southland Tales. You know, the, the other three, at least, it's the same director. I wouldn't really say the, the genre is especially similar. I, I wouldn't really say that, you know, it's not the only movie with action scenes set around cars that Paul W. Anderson has directed, but beyond that... There's not a lot of yeah. This is this is fairly different than most of his other movies. Now that brings us to yeah. So the the reason that I own this movie and the reason I decided to review it is because Paul W. Anderson made it. Now. Since I will be criticizing certain aspects of the movie, I want to let you know where I stand politically. I'm progressive. I try to empathize with everyone, though if you're causing harm, you need to stop, including if that means that the only way to stop your violence is for someone to get physical as long as they don't go any further than absolutely necessary. I don't think police is the way to stop young people breaking the law. I think it's, it's empathy, it's opportunity. And for sure, like, if if you are on the other side of that, this is not a movie you're going to like. This is this movie definitely has more empathy for the the young people than than the cops. And that's also that's something that some people really can't stand about it. And I get that. You know, I, I, I think at least one critic basically said, you know, it, it paints like. British bobbies, I want to say they're going, you know, just the average copper as like this kind of Nazi esque figure of, you know, overreach and violating personal rights. And, and yeah. And then at other times, it almost does seem like they are just trying to stop the, the, negative behavior and, and you know Paul W. Anderson it, it being a Paul W. Anderson movie of course it wasn't really thought through I when you watch the movie like again like I mentioned I, I try to empathize with them like they're doing really awful things and like it's it, often when a movie wants you to empathize with someone who does the wrong thing it'll show you that they have no other choice or that they've been abused that kind of thing and this one like I there is definitely a sense that like Billy like someone failed Billy and I don't mean like in in class I meant I mean that they should have gotten him, they, they should have prepared him better for, for life, and they didn't. And now he's stuck in this, you know, cycle of doing the wrong thing, being thrown in prison, getting out and doing the wrong thing again. Now... There is a little bit of diversity in the movie. There are some black people. There's at least one Asian person. A lot of the cast are white, though. You know, some some of the good guys, some of the bad guys, white. 
before I start talking details about the technical aspects, let me start by saying the people are very talented. I'm not calling into question anyone's skill or enthusiasm. The music, cinematography, editing, etc. fits the environment perfectly. A snapshot of when and where it's set. It clearly has empathy for the people it depicts and their real life counterparts. Like, you know, musically, you know, you can find almost all of the soundtrack for free on YouTube. You know, I, I'm, I'm not sure anyone's collected them. I, I just went track by track, you know, copy pasted the name from the the Wikipedia listing of the soundtrack to the in into YouTube and yeah, it's 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 music that really expresses the frustrations of of youth. Let's see. So, right, one of the details of the RAM rating, the car that they drive into the shopping mall window, they stole from someone. They, they jacked it. So, this was written by Paul W. Anderson, and, yeah, um, you know, the site is now the only thing he's written or directed that I haven't watched, but just to briefly go through, you know, the other movies that he wrote are Monster Hunter, all six Resident Evil movies, the first Death Race movie, Alien vs. Predator 1, and... And, and this, obviously, and the site. And, yeah, this has both, you know, his, his, his good and bad traits are, are on display here. The, the, um, there's a clear enthusiasm. Like, he's not dispassionate, he's not, he doesn't, he clearly cares. He cares about the story and the characters and such. But he has this tendency. He really likes to write a lot of characters. Really, most of his characters, most major characters at least, you know, the, the ones that have personality at all. He likes to write them as really obnoxious, and it just it makes it a lot harder to empathize, like to to empathize or identify with anyone. And I think it's it's very possible to watch this entire movie and find that you simply cannot identify with anyone. That none of them are three dimensional enough and just yeah like the the it's it's on the one hand clearly part of the the reason he made the movie is to appeal to young people you know to to say look i'm i'm one of you i i think this way too which i'm not entirely sure he, he seems like a perfectly pleasant you know he he really doesn't come across as someone who would behave even remotely the way that the young characters in this do but I think that, you know, he's he's doing that to try to basically, you know, he's he's saying, look, I'm, I'm speaking your language so that he can then say, please stop doing what you're doing, you know, and that is admirable. That's definitely, I, I don't think, I've never really believed in scared straight. I don't think there's very many, <laughs> most destructive behavior Yeah, before I, I do think that a number of destructive behaviors, the the reason someone does it is because they feel a, they're looking for boundaries. They are trying to see like how far can I go? And and I mean, in in some ways, it's almost like a, does anyone even care? Does anyone care about me? No matter, you know. So so you do the worst thing you can think of 
to try to get someone to react so that you yeah and I understand I understand the appeal you know when, when you when you acknowledge that that is the reality I understand the appeal of thinking okay so what we need to do is scare them straight we need to make it clear that if they do that kind of thing they're gonna be serious consequences you know I understand that appeal but more statistically speaking a very small percentage of people are going to do continue to do really destructive harmful things if you give them opportunity so that you know if, if they if they don't feel like yeah if you give them choices if you if you make it so that they can succeed most people are going to try to succeed instead it's just it's not really human nature to be intentionally destructive we we by our nature try to to live in a way that is that that works you know now the hmm, so plot twists yeah I guess it handles plot twists fine I don't think there are too many I yeah they're 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 decent they're not too bad I could understand an argument that there might be too few but it's not really it's not a twist heavy movie it's not a movie focused on plot twists I will say at least one of them is almost too easy to figure out for the viewer but this is not really one of those movies that works only until you learn the twist and then it completely falls apart you know the, if if you're looking for a movie that's full of twists and turns this is not it but yeah so it was also directed by Paul W. Anderson and the yeah all the movies he's directed are Monster Hunter Resident Evil the final chapter Pompeii Resident Evil Retribution the 2011 Three Musketeers movie Resident Evil Afterlife, Death Race 1, Alien vs. Predator 1, Resident Evil 1, The Sight, Soldier, Event Horizon, Mortal Kombat 1, and this. So, Paul W. Anderson, I used to enjoy his movies with a lot less reservation. I became aware of him around 1999. I liked him at the time. When Resident Evil Apocalypse first came out, I had fairly few criticisms of it. I never thought that his Alien vs. Predator movie was any good, or his Mortal Kombat movie, you know, various others. I think it was with his The Three Musketeers movie that I fully accepted that he's legitimately not a good filmmaker. He has some technical skill, but he's bad at other aspects of filmmaking. And then there were a few years where I didn't take any enjoyment from his work. I think it was as of 2016 I've enjoyed his work whilst acknowledging that his movies are not particularly good although he has a few good ideas. Having now watched all but one of his movies I would say provided you you know you you have the right you approach it with the right mindset every movie he's directed he's written or directed is watchable although Resident Evil Retribution the, the fifth Resident Evil movie tests that by being very tedious so I made a list of some of the things that Paul W.S. Anderson very frequently does in his movies that I would consider mistakes I realize not everybody agrees with me on all of these so yeah the when I made the video on Monster Hunter, I went through the entire list. This time I'm only going to go over the ones that are true of this movie. 
But yeah, his movies are gloriously stupid. Um, yeah, he likes. Yeah, he will have obnoxious dick measuring between characters. Overall, I wouldn't say this movie has a huge problem with action scenes being too long and there being too little breathing room in between, but I do think it is... There are some problems in, in that regard, and... Yeah, it, it really feels like he's he's kind of afraid that if a lot of time passes without action or the action scenes end too quickly, you know, the young people in the audience are going to lose, you know, lose interest. And let's see. Yeah, he you know, he has fun with the R rating when he gets to work with it. That is true of this one. Yes, that is most of the. Oh, right, yeah. He'll be a big fan of, you know, a movie or such, and he'll he'll especially be really into certain elements, and he'll grab an element and recreate it in his own film, either with no explanation or ridiculous explanation. And just, yeah, in, in ways that just don't fit. There is a very clear, like, when he made this movie, he was definitely really, he really, really loved the movie A Clockwork Orange. Now, that movie is a masterpiece. But there are aspects of that movie that are recreated here without him completely thinking about whether or not it makes sense for them to... Uh, there's definitely... Jude Law has some Alex DeLarge going on here, and there is this, like... At times, the, the England that the movie is set in seems just this... inhumane... like post-industrial burnt out husk it's not it doesn't it doesn't support or sustain life the the authorities are at you know at times come across as you know not not like literally inhuman but inhumane at least and and not really respecting yeah I already mentioned you know not respecting people not not res respecting the civil liberties and such but like the the you know for one thing if you're gonna do that kind of thing like Kubrick didn't just do it because he thought it would be kinda cool he did it because he had a message you know A Clockwork Orange is a movie that has something to say and this movie I mean I wouldn't say it has nothing to say, but I'm just not sure, like, it's basically, what he has to say with this movie can be boiled down to, you, young people who are doing illegal things, stop it. I understand where you're coming from, but stop it. And that's just not, 
like if that's all you have then then you really shouldn't be invoking someone as talented as Kubrick who let's not forget was still alive at this point like there's some chance that Stanley Kubrick actually watched this movie and sat there confused like why did this guy recreate stuff from a clockwork orange and just yeah it it because he liked it he thought it was cool you know which which really holy crap Paul Alex DeLarge is not cool that's that's really not what you should take from that I it's, Alex DeLarge probably he thinks he him he thinks of himself as cool for sure but he's a sociopath and and like that movie isn't really about us we're not really supposed to identify with him or like feel that much empathy towards him he's kind of a picture of a a Britain that has completely lost its way you know it's it's more it's it's kind of a ah what's the word like when you when you It's, it's, you know, you're, yeah, you're supposed to watch the movie and think, oh, wow, are we really like that? We should definitely try not to be like that. And Paul, like, for sure, there are times where we were supposed to empathize with Billy. Now, right, the, another thing that Paul Lewis Anderson will often do when he has, black characters in his movies he has a tendency for at least one of them to be really stereotypical we're supposed to laugh at them but he pushes it too far it's like something out of an 80s movie or something he's if this one isn't too bad on that there is a little bit but it's nowhere near as bad as he would get later and by later I do mean like event horizon is much much worse than this so you know, I'm, I'm not just talking about way later. In general, terrible comic relief with corny jokes. Yeah, there's there's some real bad jokes and some real groaners. Now. Let's see. I'll, yeah, so a lot of things in, the mov in his movies are unmotivated. They're there because he likes them. Not because they make sense to be in the film. It's it's like the 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 movie paints a picture of an England where like the cops are practically fascists, but like they're not actually any good at cap catching. Is like like they're they're Billy and others will engage in these like completely random ah what's the word like crime spree like they'll they'll go out and they'll they'll you know yeah they'll seal the car and drive somewhere and the cops will show up and somehow Billy and the others will be so such good drivers and so so smart and so strategic that they'll manage to outmaneuver the cops and you just like you almost wonder how did he even get caught in the first place? like did he just like get bored one day and and go and turn himself in like I'm so bored with being outside of prison please just it's just they seem completely terrible at catching anyone, which just, you know, that, that I, th I think the, the reason, the reason for that is that the, 
the, this appeal to young people, to, to people, you know, he's basically saying, look how cool you are, this is you, look how badass you are, this is, this is how good you look, but, like, the, it, it kind of breaks the movie, because, the, the you know like like as like so like happens with a lot of his movies he makes the bad guys at times be so inept okay okay bad guys in this case obviously you know the but the the antagonists he makes them so inept that there's almost no sense of threat like is what why is Why, why are they, they if, like, why is anyone in this movie's world, well, I guess not very many are, afraid of being caught by the cops? The cops, like, the cops could, couldn't catch a cold. It's, it's absurd how bad they are, and then, at other times, they're incredibly competent. So it's like, it's just, you know, basically, based on what he wants at the, what he wants out of the given scene. Now, I guess that is about it. so. So the opening of the movie does a good job of conveying, like, who Billy is, how he... How it affects him. The the things he does. Now I am not gonna give away whether the ending is happy or sad. Let's see, does it fit with what came before? To an extent. To an extent it does fit with what came before. And I do think that the ending, like Okay, so the following is damning with faint praise. The ending is probably about as good as it could have been for the movie. Like, it's really not... is not some masterpiece. But it, like, it could definitely have been worse. Like I said, damning with faint praise. It doesn't really use Deus Ex Machina or other convenient writing. Now, the movie does sometimes lose your interest. It's mostly, honestly, I found the, the action scenes themselves quite boring. Uh, they're just, they're fairly unmotivated. Like, when you're making an action movie, ideally, the plot leads into the action, and the action then furthers the plot. But here, it's just kind of like, they feel like, like, it, it is almost like watching someone just play GTA for a while and just only do open world stuff, not do missions. You know, it's just like, well, you know, they felt like ram raiding, they felt like doing this or that, and just... Yeah, you know, and that is, like, if your action movie, if the action scenes in your action movie are one of the least interesting and appealing parts, that, you, you made, you messed up. You made a mistake somewhere along the way. Now... So, this is one of those kinds of movies where, for a number of the characters, you just don't find out very much. So, if that means you can't get into a movie, I'm afraid this is a movie you won't be able to get into, or will have more trouble. And it is also one of those movies where, I mean, I would say every single character has at least one, at least one major, like, aspect where they're just not very likable. 
and again, yeah, if that means you can't get into, if that's the kind of thing that makes it difficult for you to get into a movie, this is a movie that's going to be difficult for you to get into. Now, when I saw the name Sadie Frost on the cast, I didn't think I knew her from anything. I, I thought, you know, well, sure, I'll, I'll meet a new talent. That sounds fun. But no, she's, she's in the 1992 Dracula. And she gives an incredible performance. No, really. I, I wouldn't say that that's an overall good movie. I honestly don't remember it, but I think I would probably not think very highly of it today if I watched it again. But I do... For sure, some of the acting is very compelling. And yeah, she, she does. I, I'm not sure I've seen her in anything else, but yeah, in these... In that movie... She does do well, and for sure in this one, she's she, she tries. She she does what she can to. Yeah, she's she's got a lot of energy and enthusiasm in her performance. She's introduced picking up Billy when he gets out of jail, and she parks the car literally right on top of the text where it says no parking. Just, you know, immediately we could see, she, you know, she doesn't follow the rules. This is right outside the prison. You know, like, she's probably not going to get arrested for that by itself or something. But, like, she's risking a fine at the very least. And she's not exactly swimming in money Scrooge McDuck style. Jude Law, incredible talent, plays Billy. And he's introduced sitting in his cell and he's got this dead look in his eyes he comes across as detached like he you know he's not scared he's not relieved he's, he's not scared in prison he's not relieved that he's leaving prison he kinda just doesn't care and Sean Perchwee another huge town plays Tommy who wants more control of the the the, the turf that Billy at least used to be in charge of and Sean Bean also a huge talent plays Venning Jonathan Price known among other things from Brazil plays Conway and he's also like again it's it's like if you if you did, if you watched some of the separate scenes that he's in in this, and you watch them without context, I'm not sure you'd guess that they were in the same movie, because there are times where he really does come across as very empathetic and and like he's trying to solve this problem, and then other times where he's base like he might as well have stamped across his forehead, "I am a fascist." And it's just complete, like, at, at some point, I really do hope someone, I'll grant that it might make his movies a little more boring to watch, but at some point, I kind of hope that someone gets across to Paul W. Anderson, that doesn't make any sense. Like, I'll grant that there are people in real life who, you know, at times can be incredibly appealing and other times can be absolutely awful. But you, movies don't reflect real life perfectly. It's just, like, if you have a character that goes to such extremes, like, some some people can make it work. I, I don't think Paul Lewis Anderson is one of those people. And Jason Isaacs plays a market trader. And just, you know, huge talent. Originally, Paul Davis Anderson wanted him to be in all of his movies, but the last one he's been in is the first Resident Evil film. If you don't remember seeing him, it's because he only does a brief voice role. Maybe the two had a falling out. Oh, right, I wrote here in my notes, is that a mullet? Yikes. I don't think that's... I think I'm thinking of one of the other... Yeah, I don't think he's the one with the mullet. That's... 
I want to say that's Sean Bean. Yeah. Whoops. Now, some critics said that the leads are too pretty, too posh to be convincing as most time criminals. I think they have a point. Honestly, Paul and others were probably worried that people wouldn't watch it if the leads weren't pretty enough. And I cannot rule out they might have been right about that. So the the dialogue. Wow. Um yeah, so this movie the the DVD I own has no subtitles. And you know I'm more familiar with American English than British English. And there's there's a bunch of slang in this, so you know, some of it is affected by that. The dialogue is is okay. Sometimes it's even slightly good. Like there are bits that are legitimately well written and, and the and, and well delivered. But there's definitely like a bunch of it where it really At the end of the day, Paul W. S. Anderson, you know, he's he's a, a normal guy. You know, he was he was fairly young, but he wasn't quite a teenager, and he's trying to write for teenagers who, you know, are always stealing cars and such. And he he did what he could. He tried to to write the way that. They talk, and I mean, ultimately, your mileage may vary. It's, certainly, for some people, it will be pretty unbearable. I, I saw one one person write that Joe is basically like way too loud to be likable, and yeah, there's definitely some some truth to that. Now, characterization, like some of the some of the characters you see what they're like in front of their friends, you know, trying to be cool, but then you also see them like with their parents or in front of cops and such and you see other sides to them. Now, the cinematography was handled by DP Tony Emi, R.I.P. He DP'd 45 films and 42 TV things, I guess, episodes, movies, and such. I don't think any of it... Yeah, I, I looked through the entire list. None of it... Nothing rang a bell. So, this is the only thing that I've seen that he, but yeah. The movie tends to keep it fairly easy to follow when something suddenly happens, like action scenes. It doesn't have hyperactive cinematography when it should be more calm. I'm not sure there are many unnecessary shots. And, and like, there are times where you can really tell, like, these, these people understand cinematography. Like, the... They're, they're like crane shots and like very carefully, I would say probably dolly shots. And it's just like, you know, for, for, for those who might not know, these kinds of things take a lot of of time and, and money to, you know, you got to you got to figure out exactly where you want the camera, the, the movement you want it to make. Then you have to figure out how the characters in the shot move so that they don't, like, end up, like, with their back turned when, when they shouldn't be. Or, like, 
you know, standing at a at an angle that is that is awkward. There's there's a lot of of thinking that goes into getting something like that right. And yeah, there there are several difficult shots in this that make the movie better than it would have been if they had taken the easy way out. And some of the lighting is also incredible. Now, the editing was handled by David Stiven, who edited Crocodile Dundee 1 and 2. I was going to say both, but I think there is at least... Are there four of them? Wow. Good on you, mate. The first one was fine. The second one is kind of bonkers. I, I... Yeah. Anyway. And yes. I apologize unreservedly for that terrible Aussie accent. He also edited Darkman, which is impeccably edited. That is that is one of the most well edited. Just just brilliantly edited. And yeah, he does a good job editing this. You know, in addition to the cinematography, the editing also keeps it easy to follow fast moving scenes, light action scenes keeps more calm when that is called for I'm not sure there are there I would say some scenes should be trimmed down I'm not sure I would say there's an entire scene that should just be cut overall now right so this is produced by yeah, I don't always talk about producers, but for this movie, there was so little stuff online, so... Yeah, this was produced by Jeremy Bolt, who produced 35 movies total. And, I mean, he's produced... I think every single thing that... Paul W. Anderson has written and or directed. I, I'm not sure there's a single movie that the two didn't... Hmm, I'm not seeing the site here, but other than that, it does look like it is all of them. Oh yeah, they did produce the Dead or Alive movie. That one is, it's more fun than it has any right to be. It's, it's better than it... Okay, it, it, it's... It's not better than it has any right to be. It's not that good of a movie. But it's a perfectly fun time. And Laurie Borg also helped produce this. And she produced 22 movies total. And other than this, the only thing I've seen that she produced is Phantoms, where Affleck was the bomb. It's not a special effects heavy movie, but there are a few things, and they are done well, well handled, and stunts also, not a huge amount of them, but they're really, really well done. Now... So the action largely consists of car chases and like in general like the tension from driving like the threat that you might hit someone or someone might get hit by a car that, that kind of thing and you know there's definitely some some tense bits of, of that there's some Yeah, like when when Paul W. Anderson really applies himself, he can make tremendously tense scenes sometimes. Now, the music is handled by Barrington Felon, R.I.P., and he handled 16 movies and he has 44 TV credits. The only other movie I know that he did the music for is 
the Mangler, which, wow, that is, yeah. I mean, just because he did that movie doesn't mean that he loved doing it. It might have just been a paycheck. Now, four pieces of music composed by him for this, and they used other music as well. And, yeah, like, the, the music is really well chosen and used well. Like, that is legitimately, like, very often, Paul W. Sanderson movies, the, the music... I, uh, to be fair, I can, I can only say it with, I have trouble remembering it for this, uh, for his other movies, but for sure it's an issue for his Resident Evil movies. Now, not the first one, that one has an incredible score. I believe I used to own it, but now I can't find the CD, but it's excellent. It is worth buying separately. It's better than the movie deserves. It's it's really, really good. Like, so, sometimes years will pass without me listening to that music or watching that movie, and I'll be able, I'll still remember exactly how the music goes. But other than that, like, there'll be this really obnoxious techno that, like, like doesn't even fit the scene. Like, it doesn't like, it, it just feels like someone, like you're watching the movie and someone is playing techno in the next room so loud that you can't, you know, you can't help but hear that. Like, it, it, yeah, and that is not at all the case here. I think this is one of the times where he just, he admitted that that wasn't something he would be able to do a great job at, and so he hired someone who would be able to do a great job and yeah 100 percent the like if if the movie appeals to you i could imagine buying the score separately might also be worth it you know back when you couldn't just listen to it on youtube anyway the music videos for a couple of them are on youtube as well now some really good sound design, like some scenes where, okay, that that is not what it sounded like on set, and they do a really good job. Yeah. I already mentioned the comedy it can be fairly corny. Like, the, the comedy in this tends to be someone will say something that sounds, like, like you can tell that that's supposed to be a joke. You know, it's not going to be particularly funny, but clearly, it is like, like, structurally, that's a joke. Like, you have the, let me think, feed line, punch line, you know, that, that kind of thing. You know, a character will say something, another character will respond, and we're supposed to laugh at the response. So, pacing. These characters would be a lot easier to spend this much time with if they weren't so consistently obnoxious, one note, and spend so much of their time doing the same illegal things for the thrill of them and the audience. Like, there's... It's so... And Paul W. Anderson usually does, like, a lot of his action scenes are fairly motivated. You know, they're not necessarily good action scenes, but you can point to them and say, oh, well, that happened because character A wanted something, and they thought that doing that would be the way to get what they wanted, you know. But here, it's just, eh, I'm bored. Crime spree. Now, the movie doesn't spend that much time building up before it gets into tension. And, I mean, considering, you know, the movie's not that long, so it is a good idea to go for, for tension right away. And certainly sometimes, like, it is wild to me how slow-paced his Alien vs. Predator movie is. Like, there, there was a time 
where I remembered that movie as being two hours long. And then I looked at it and it's like, it's not that much more than 90 minutes. I think it's less than 100 minutes. But it feels so much longer because so much of it is so slow. I, you know, Film Brain did his review of it. He, he, in his review, he pointed out, I, he said something along the lines of, Paul, you're not Ridley Scott, and this movie is not Alien. Something like that. The movie is an hour and 39 minutes without any credits, and 42 and a half with. So, yeah. And yeah, you know, if you're not interested, 30 minutes in, the rest of the movie, yeah, the movie just probably isn't your kind of thing. So the, yeah, the best element of the movie, you know, despite the awkward handling, the message about empathy for those who have very little, the worst aspects are the Paul W. Anderson tropes. And, yeah, it'll, it'll be less frustrating if you go into the movie knowing that, lowering your expectations. Ultimately, you know, movies he made later are much, much worse than this. You know, it's, it's not a huge deal. It doesn't break the movie. I mean, honestly, I would say that, like... Yeah, he made Mortal Kombat like the year after this or something. I would say in a lot of respects that movie is a much, much worse. Like, it can be fun to watch, but a lot of his worst traits are on full display there. Now... Yeah, the... I was most looking forward to the Paul Lewis Anderson tropes, and... Yeah, the movie basically lived up to my expectations. There it is. Now. Yeah. The trailer gives away too much. The, the one minute 40 second trailer. I haven't been able to find any other trailers than that one, but yeah. Gives away too much, but it also gives you a good idea of what the movie is like. If you like the trailer, you'll like the movie. If you don't, you won't. The cover and poster do not give away too much and largely give you a good idea of what the movie is like. You know, if you like the cover and poster, you're more likely to like the movie than if you do not. Now, I looked this movie up on the tomato meter, and it does not have a Rotten Tomato score. There is there is a single review, and that is not enough to, you know, you need at least two for a score. So, there's just you know, two two dots. And poss possibly like a line on it. Lo looks like a an emoji for a just exasperated face. It does have a an audience score. Forty nine percent, based on over a thousand ratings. So, yeah. The average rating for users is 3.3 out of 5. So, I mean, that's not terrible. The movie is not Metacritic at all, so I can't talk about the rating on there. On IMDb, the movie has a 5.4 out of 10. And 43 user reviews and 16 links in the... IMDb external reviews section and eight of them both worked and were in languages that I speak or more more importantly read yeah the the 2743 
IMDb users voted on this at all. So this is not a movie that's that a lot of people around the world care about today. Yeah. Now 19.3% gave it a 5, 18.6 gave it a 6, 14.4 gave it a 7. 11.1 gave it a 4, and yeah. So yeah, as you know, people found it very average, which makes a lot of sense. Now, it's not a very violence-heavy movie. It does have a lot of destruction, but there's not a lot of violence against people. The, I, I would say the violence against people that there is is quite effective. Uh, I don't think there was a single time... It, yes, every single time there was a threat of bodily injury or even death. Every single time, without fail, I always cared. Every single time, it, it got me, like, on the edge of my seat. And every single... Yeah, it it was it was the right amount. Like it's not it's not so much that it just completely overwhelms you. And it's not so or or gets tedious or numbing and it's not so little that it lacks an edge. There is not a lot of sexual material and I mean I have more to say about it but I can't without spoilers so I will get into it in the in the notes taken while watching section now when you look up a movie on IMDb sometimes the parents guide will be like full of detail and sometimes it'll have almost no detail something I I found very funny when I looked it up years and years I, I guess by now at least a decade ago when I looked up the movie Mr. and Mrs. Smith someone had written pretty much like every single movement or gesture relating to sex in that movie or, or at least to to one scene uh, no yeah to at least one scene in that movie and it was just like well i guess someone really liked that scene and you know told themselves this i'm i'm doing this so that people know you know like if it's if it's a sexual you know you don't need every single little detail you can just say this is what is shown so you know if you're if your kid watches this, this is what you talk to them about, you know, but no, they, they went into painstaking detail. The following, I'm about to do a dramatic reading of the entire, the, the only details other than ratings in the parent's guide. Foul language throughout. Faux underworld dialogue with incessant juvenile use of fuck, shit, etc. I mean... It's completely gratuitous to point out that the dialogue is faux underworld dialogue. That that doesn't have anything to do... Like, nobody's, like, looking up the parents' guy for this movie and, like... It better not be faux underworld. I am not watching this movie if the person writing this dialogue doesn't capture the voice of Ram Raiders. That is just, that is not a thing that's going to happen. That's basically because they wanted people to know the dialogue is bad. And I just want you to know, I noticed and I appreciate it. So, yeah, at this point it is not going to surprise you that this movie is not capital C cinema, but instead cinematic junk food. Now...
yeah, this critic puts it really well. Ultimately unfocused and turgid affair. Quoting, yeah, so quoting a few fellow critics here, closest comparison. It's like train spotting toned down to the level of the warriors. A nihilistic little rebel without a cause film, where a baby faced Jude Law loots and pillages big box stores for kicks in the bleak near future. Borrowing from Blade Runner and Gotham City to build his vision of a country divided. Yeah. Well put. Paul Paul Davis Anderson actually worked on the script for three years. And right, and this is the, the movie that Sadie Frost where Sadie Frost and Jude Law first met and they later got married. And yeah, the film was widely criticized when it was released in the UK for glamorizing and encouraging criminal behavior. As I already mentioned earlier, I don't think it really... Like, if you watch this movie and it gives you the impulse to go out and do something destructive, then you miss the message of the movie. Most likely it was just depicting stuff that was going on and sadly a number of people don't really understand that a movie can depict something that's going on and glorify it without that meaning that someone's going to go out and imitate it. Like I, I would say Train Spotting is one of the best anti-drug movies that I've ever watched because it actually understands those people. Like. If I had never watched that movie, I still would have never gone and used drugs, but I've watched that movie and I've watched a bunch of American movies that tried the scared straight approach. And yeah, I really don't think that it's very likely for the scared straight approach to, to work. Oh, huh. Right, I will just real quick take care of that. I have a bit of a headache because of that. Taking pills against it. I can take some every six hours at most. And it has been six hours. There we go. Now, right, all actors on this movie had extensive training in stunt driving. Makes a lot of sense. And Paul Davis Anderson got offered the job to direct Mortal Kombat after New Line Cinema. That film's backers saw this film. Which does make a certain amount of sense. The the soundtrack and the the sort of the, the youthful energy now. Ewan McGregor actually lost the the part to, to Jude Law. I, I could definitely see him playing the role as well. Think a more melancholy lock, stock, and two smoking barrels. See it for the soundtrack alone. One person says, showy soundtrack. That is perhaps true, yeah. Now, yeah. 
I guess that is what good, good acting is. It makes you feel sympathy for a person who does not care about other people. It's shocking that at one time, Paul W. Anderson had potential. A good throwback to A Clockwork Orange in Brazil. That actually might be why Jonathan Price is in it, because Paul W. Anderson liked the movie Brazil, which he should. It's, an, it's a masterpiece. But again, that movie has things on its mind. That movie has things to say and this one just doesn't really, it, it certainly doesn't have as much or as intelligent, interesting things to say. Now, I guess that is it for the I will say some of the reviews online are quite good. They, yeah, really do a good job analyzing the movie, pointing out what works and what doesn't. Right, and uh, yeah, one of the critics, uh, you know, my DVD doesn't come with the commentary track that is on other DVDs, but yeah, Paul W. Anderson on the DVD commentary track is particularly interesting when he discusses the influence of Blade Runner and Clockwork Orange, and how he was attempting to create a stylized, unidentified city in an unidentified future time. And yeah, like, a lot of the way he does get... Ah, what's the word? Yeah, you know, he, he, you do legitimately feel like it is this, I, I mean, it's definitely not set when he came out or earlier, but like, is it one year away, 10 years away, you know, obviously by now, you know, 27 years down the line, we know that technology, you know, changed dramatically since then, but that's not really, you know, it's, it's a low budget thing. And it's not really attempting to, it's, it's not really about technology so much as behavior. But yeah, I recommend this movie to big fans of Paul Davis Anderson and anyone else who cares about those who have very little. Now the the DVD, the, the one I got at least, came with a the, the trailer that's also online, one minute forty seconds, seven minutes and seven seconds of cast and crew interviews, which are, are decent, some interesting enough things, you know. I'm almost certain it was just like they did it for press when they made the movie and you know when they released the DVD actually come to think of it I'll, I'll see if I can really quickly determine when was the DVD itself no nope, the DVD was released in 2015 the 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 interviews I can imagine it was like they would be shown on television to promote the movie back when it first came out. It's nothing special, it's nothing mind-blowing, it's not a, it's not them looking back on it years later or something. And 
the the DVD lists that it, it refers to it the yeah there's six minutes and thirteen seconds of what the DVD cover refers to as unedited B-roll. Is that a warning? A threat? It can't be a promise, can it? Now, depending on your country, this you know this can be streamed on Tubi TV, Pluto TV, Fandor, Amazon channel. So, my rating is five examples of bad habits as a filmmaker that Paul W. Anderson would hold on to for decades to come out of ten. And yes, that brings us to the next section and the first thoughts section. Thought section start. Disclaimers. So, if you don't care about these disclaimers, try to keep them short and relevant, but your mileage may vary. You can skip right ahead to the section of your choice via the description box. I often try to talk very fast during the disclaimers, since a lot of this is very standard information. I'm not going to keep speaking as fast as I sometimes do during this section, once I get into the rest of the video itself. With that said, please do note that some of the specific discussion of the movie may be in this section. So, from here on out, I will no longer be warning before I spoil things about this movie. I will warn before I... If, if I spoil anything about any other movie than this, any other at all, I will verbally warn before I do so and hold them in the next finger while I do. Now... Let's, so the... Yeah, the rest of this video is not a review. It's a series of, well, thoughts. Some is analysis, some is analysis. Some of his MST3K riff tracks and other jokes. Now the... Let's yeah, so the time codes for all the section in the description box. And the section right after this one is thought that, thoughts that I had while watching in chronological order. You can think of it as a running commentary, live tweeting, or the like. So, does the movie appear to have empathy for the least likable characters? I mean, ultimately, probably the least likable is is Tommy, I guess, because the Billy. There certainly at times the movie has empathy for Billy. The movie definitely has empathy for Joe. Yeah, I'm I'm not sure there's very much empathy for for Tommy. He's fairly. Like it, it's basically just he's he's the bad guy. I I don't remember anything that that made him look even a little bit good. So that brings us to the final section. Notes taken while watching. What has prison taught you, Billy? Well, it gave me time to practice my eyelids to large stare. They exchange candied hearts with meaningful writing. I was watching videos here on YouTube on the first Matrix movie recently, and someone pointed out that Neo being told to consume certain things is like how in Alice in Wonderland she finds a thing with food in it that says, Eat me, which when the story was written and the old cartoon... I want to say sometimes in the 1960s was made was simply a command but by the 90s if you found something like that on the back of say a candy that meant Bart Simpson got his hands on it they don't like the music in the car so you know she throws it out this guy deserves to have his car stolen wow my accent there was almost as bad as Sadie Frost's I just want there to be an outtake where she goes this, this slaps. Let's give that guy his car back. She throws a box of Ferrero Rocher out the window. She's going to have to work really hard to get my sympathy after that. Where's Bebop? Have you checked with Rocksteady and the Shredder? I do appreciate that when the party is broken up, 
at times the light from the police helicopter has this larger than life feel to it like it feels like god himself is staring down on them in judgment and they're flipping him off especially right before the scene cuts welcome home i am at this point convinced that these characters are incapable of just handing something to someone else they only ever throw things for others to catch hi sarah nice dressing gown is my dad in well, he was until you knocked on the door, jackass. Is your middle name Cockblocker? I gotta say, I'm really not accustomed to Paul W. Anderson movies having a moral message, but with Sarah telling Billy his father's worried about him, and us seeing Billy's room, and then Joe talking to talking about how someone else ended up, and all this. You know, clearly the movie has empathy for him and doesn't only think of him as something for young people to idolize. You two want coffee? That stuff's bad for you, Billy. Okay, that was a little funny. Pretty good tension when Billy stands in the street waiting to get hit by a car. I mean, obviously I don't actually expect him to die this early in the movie. So the fact that the movie can get me, like, invested, yeah, very, very nicely done. So Jonathan Price is like, well, what are those? And he's, you know, what are those? And, and Billy's like, presents. Can you prove it? I don't have to. I know my rights. Then why did you let him in the door at all? He doesn't have a warrant. You'll even steal trash. I mean... I think we need to be more, more vigilant about what happens to our trash. Why am I the only person going down to the dock tonight to charge the seagulls to dine on our trash? It just... it's... it's... yeah. And Joe holds up her pinky. What's that? The size of his dick? And here I thought you were offering him tea. Look at this place. How do people live in this filth? You gave up your right to judge anybody else's taste the moment you decided business in the front, party in the back. What are you doing outside of a fantasy franchise anyway? Looking for James Bond? Your daughter, maybe? legitimately tense when the black cop suddenly realizes he's been lured into a trap and we see all these small-time crooks and they start throwing bricks and such for a second I thought that fridge or whatever it was was gonna hit him not his car which come to think of it that was probably the idea the movie the way that it's filmed and edited they could have made it clear that it was headed for the car I think we were supposed to think, wow, are they actually going to drop that thing on a cop? I mean, no matter how much they hate him, that is just vicious. I like the brief scene where Billy throws a bunch of packs of cigarettes into his father's apartment through, I want to say it's like the mail slot or something, while his father sits clearly emotional, clearly aware that it's Billy. A father and son who obviously do care about each other, they just can't express it in a healthy way they 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 can't actually help each other with their situation you know a lot of men have trouble communicating their emotions who said you can't buy happiness the Beatles among others I know it's a rhetorical question do I sound like a person who does not know what a rhetorical question is where is my van resting in pieces evidently Joe yet again proves that she's more perceptive than she might at first appear by pointing out that Billy and I want to say Tommy are just engaged in dick measuring. Billy losing his home and having to move into a train car does work decently. You know, it, it's it's something that makes it clear that the conflict has hit his home, so to speak. He thought he could always escape consequences. 
So Joe goes to talk to, I want to say Tommy, and he cuts her shirt open, gropes her, makes out with her. She makes it clear that isn't what she wants. And so we have a sexual assault presented to be erotic, absolutely disgusting. So Billy wants to go shopping in the fancy place to outdo Tommy. One of his friends likes the idea while the other points out how dangerous it is. Okay, so I'm almost certain what Billy said was, I'll tell you tomorrow, Tommy. But it cracks me up that it kind of sounded like he said, I'll tell you a tomato. And Joe is going to leave, asks an upset Billy to join her. Feel the force. Man, in his youth, Obi-Wan Kenobi was kind of a brat. I know, technically not the same actor, but you and Ewan McGregor do look a lot alike. And Joe does ultimately agree to go with Billy on the big job. Turns out the cops were waiting for them for the big job because Tommy told on them. And Joe and Billy see a cop car driving towards them in the garage. And, you know, uh, again, the way it's shot, it, it gets this sort of mythical quality to it. It doesn't feel like this is just some cops about to arrest them. It feels like a divine judgment. Their actions have caught up to them. Billy won the game of chicken, but he drove right into a PSA about watching the road when you're driving. I appreciate that the ending wants to communicate that if you live too much of your life like this, you end up facing permanent consequences. But ultimately, it was a bit obvious from the start that things would go like this. As usual, Paul W. Sanderson delivers an anticlimactic ending after seemingly building to something big and cool. I'm not going to claim that there's no action here at the end in the climax of the movie, but we were basically expecting a lot of looting and chaos, and all there was was some dry, you know, there was a little bit of driving, and then two car crashes, and that's it. And also, like, it's supposed to be about, like, small-time criminals. I don't think anybody ever actually fights anyone else. Like, they're... I'm not saying there's no violence between people, but it tends to be property that's the target. The the one time that someone very intentionally attacks something other than property, attacks another person, is when the young small-time criminals throw bricks and such at the black cop. And that was a compelling scene, but it was... Ah, what's the word? The, I mean, I just feel like it would have made a lot of sense for there to be at least one actual physical fight between Tommy and Billy. I mean, you don't even have to change that much about the ending. Just, like, have that, let's see. Yeah, have it turn out that there is, like, let's see. Yeah, have it turn out that, that Tommy ratted them out, so, you know, yeah, so so Billy has to abandon a car and just run off to try to escape, and then he runs into Tommy, realizing he he's the one who snitched, and so they get into, like, a physical fight, and after a while of, of fairly evenly matched, like, a cop shows up, and, let's see... What about... Yeah, right, and, and Tommy... Show... Yeah, Tommy is like, I was the one who called you guys. And so the cop shoots Billy. Or, yeah, something like that. You know, you you still have the, the thing of... Yeah, I, I think it's very disappointing to have something like this and not have any actual like because there's that bit where you think they're going to fight but Billy runs off and hides which was a decent like don't get me wrong his odds were terrible in that situation it was it would have been incredibly stupid of him to stay but yeah like he actually yeah Ultimately, there, there was only violence against his van. Yeah. Anyway, that is what I had to say about the movie. So, if you like this video, please comment, thumbs up, subscribe, hit that little bell. 
there should be a link to my main channel page, one, two or more links to stuff like relevant playlists, a suggested view of your watch on the screen right about now. I put out one vlog per week reviewing and sharing spoiler thoughts on a movie, and one talking about the most recent episode of the current Disney, MC Disney Plus MCU show these days, that is Hawkeye. And recently, the review and thoughts videos tend to come out very similar to this one. In other words, if you want more videos like this, you're in luck. You can check out my back catalog as well as catch my video next week. I hope you enjoyed watching as I enjoyed watching and recording, and I'll catch you next time.